be a panelist today with uh, esteemed speakers here, and I know you have worked with Solil also and some of us, Justice and Alex also on the, the Roman's refugee case, uh, which really I was just telling her that uh, how come it hasn't become an in, uh, international concern with the UN? It is a community that has been moving from one place to the other without any status and no refuge. This is something that we all need to look ahead and find. But it's related in relation to today's topic. And I know we have an academic who stuck to 15 minutes, or a minister who also, when you give a mic to any man or a, <laughs> or a chaplain or a priest, <laughs> Shahid, you'll have to just take it away from me. <laughs> no, especially to talk about fasting, but. The fasting, uh, uh, you, there's a uh, short PowerPoint presentation which will be played during the uh, dinner time. You will know that exactly, but uh, you heard already from uh, IDI uh, host, and thank you IDI for hosting another good event, and it's the first time that the CAJM is hosting with, uh, in partnership with IDI, and I hope it will be the last. Uh, we'll have more events in the future as well, not just in Ramadan. But IDI has used saw the video clip in some years well, but that speaks for itself that many prominent Canadians have, are supporting this organization and have done a wonderful work in its short history in this city and across the country as well. Uh, fasting in Islam is one of the five fundamental articles of faith that you have to observe as a Muslim. And the first one is the belief, of course, the dead relation of the faith. And then the other is a ritual worship, Salat, which is generally prayed in the mosque. And then the other part of giving charity, two and a half percent of your annual saving uh, for social justice, social equity in the economic equity in the society. And then the uh, uh, fasting in the month of Ramadan, as well as the one pilgrimage once in a lifetime, if you can afford financially and physically to undertake that journey. Now, compared to the other uh, fundamentals, the Salat, which is really a, a ritual worship and is within the Muslim community, that also, is, as all worships do, take the, you to nearest to God. Here, I remember a couple of months ago, not too long ago, there was a, I was a panelist in a, a multi-faith panel of about six, seven of different faiths how we talk to God. I don't know if any of you were here after that. And the common factor in all faith was that through prayers. And I was asked this question just yesterday at the Pan Am Games by a psychologist who is on duty at the polyclinic. He said he is born in Christian, he's Christian, goes to church, but still have some uh, doubts about his faith. How do we connect to God? Is God really with me? And I said right away that a number of chaplains were there. I said, well, through prayer is a means of connecting. And fasting is one way of connecting to God more so than others, because here you are abstaining from food and water from dawn to dusk. So in the state of hunger, why would God want you to be hungry? And right now in Toronto, we are fasting for 17 hours. Go further west to Winnipeg, it's more. And uh, uh, further north, uh, now they, they have a choice to go to the nearest normal city. That's what it is. <laughs> Otherwise, uh, I remember one geologist back in uh, wrote an article in 1972 going from Calgary to the Arctic, uh, about the Arctic Circle near North Pole. And it was, uh, and he asked for prayer time. He said, When was the sunset? He asked, for, Oh, in September. It was the month of <laughs> <laughs> Then he remembered that, uh, oh, uh, I'm in the, uh, above the Arctic Circle, so this is uh, six months in <laughs> of daylight. So he says, how, uh, how do you observe uh, night and day here? And I'm just uh, digressing a little bit. This is an interesting uh, story. So he said, well, uh, talk to one of the Inuit person, because he was in a mining team. And I also had a chance once to go to Greenland with a mining team, but I backed out. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, so. He said, uh, come around 7.30 or so. And he says, look on the horizon, and you will see a 
uh, white is uh, a reddish thread. And he says, uh, yes, keep looking, he says. So after about 10 minutes or 10, 15 minutes, he says, yeah, I see a little reddish thread. He said, that's how we observe that night has begun. He says, about 9 o'clock in Montreal, the nearest normal sub city south of us. And he says, how do we observe the morning now? He says, I'll come back again around 7.30. <laughs> So he went uh, again and says, look on this side here, because from the North Pole, there is any horizon is all same, circular almost. So he says, uh, what do you see? He says, I see a little whitish thread on the horizon. So he says, uh, that is when said day has begun. Mm -hmm. This is the Inuit way of observing. Mm -hmm. I don't know if any of you had encountered uh, the Inuit uh, traditions. So he says, well, then he recalls in the Quran, he said, when do you start? Because there was no clock in those days. And God said about fasting, but how do you start and end fasting? God said, well, when you start, in the Quran, the verse says that when you can distinguish black and a white thread, <coughs> which is which, that means that dawn has broken. And now you can stop eating or drinking, and your fasting begins. And sunset is easy for everyone to see. So this is how God has ordained in the Quran. And one of the purposes of the mission, like Prophet Abraham, going back to the Abrahamic tradition, his mission is uh, when he built, rebuilt the Kaaba, the Grand Mosque in Mecca, he and his son Ishmael made a prayer that, oh God, raise from us among a generation of prophets that will give the knowledge and purify. We use a key him, the Quran uses the word. And the Prophet Muhammad's mission, one of them is also, he's been raised to purify. And the purification is that one of the mission is the purification of the soul spiritually, as well as a physical purification of the body. And this is what fasting does, a worship. We see it as a worship. But at the same time, it purifies our body. And uh, one well, of the good, uh, important article recently came out from uh, Dr. Uh, Tofik Valiante, who was looking at how he, as a neurologist uh, here in Toronto, he has uh, really evaluated from the medical point. A number of articles are available. Many medical professionals, many doctors here would say fasting is good. And now the latest uh, development in blood testing as a diabetic myself, when you go for blood test, so you have to fast. Now I said, no, fasting is not needed. I said, good, I don't have to, <laughs> uh, to come back and uh, have a coffee. <laughs> so one of the purposes of fasting is purification. And the purification is the body and soul and mind, that you don't think anything wrong that is contrary to God's command. Don't think evil, committing any crime, or anything like that, and committing sin as well. And then the physical purification, your body is pure so that you are healthy to worship God all the time in the year. Because in the month of Ramadan, and for 29 and 30 days, as Muslims follow a lunar calendar that goes on, it really builds your, it's, it's an exercise, spiritual exercise, no doubt, but it's a character building exercise. It disciplines us how to behave, that my fast is not nullified, my blessings are not reduced, that I don't hurt anyone, I don't cause any harm to anyone, I don't backbite anyone, I don't uh, do anything that will be a problem for the community or country, anything like that. So that is a thought that should be going through the mind, that purifies the mind. At the same time, it's also society's care. And that is says what it means to be hungry. And I'm just going to say something about the city of Toronto. Some of you may know or heard, others may find it surprising that a country we are living in, a city we are living in, and myself, um, I, said, I thank Shahid and Barbara for inviting me to speak because I am connected with about five to six different poverty organizations, including the food bank. In my introduction, it was mentioned, chair of the Flemington Community Food Bank. We have 4,600 families registered in that food bank from Flemington Park area and just uh, in the neighborhood there. Probably the largest food bank. Now, this food bank, Red Cross has been running before for a number of years. They closed down, they couldn't run it. 
And you know, Clarendon Park is a high-risk neighborhood as identified, so-called high-risk, quote, unquote. And then the Anglican ministry took over. And Anglican ministry <coughs> couldn't run it anymore because of the cause. And, the, and in, 19, in 2010, a call went out that saved this food bank. So I got the word from, from the community legal service that this food bank is closing. So a number of organizations stepped forward. Anglican ministry was already, already there. The Presbyterian Church in that area also came forward. The two Smiley Foundations came forward. Local mosque in Tonka Park stepped forward. And in my introduction, Ansar Foundation, which was specially created for homeless and poverty reduction, I we stepped forward and saved the food bank by putting money up front for the rent. And then we discovered back rent of thirty thousand dollars that Islamic Relief in uh, Burlington said we when I sent an appeal out to people, I said. Uh, we will match dollar for dollar. So we raise fifteen thousand. They put fifteen thousand, and food bank is running today. But the problem now in the whole city of Toronto is the daily bread food bank is not getting enough money to buy some of these staple items like rice, oil, and flour and Legos. So this is needed in all food banks across the city. In Ramadan, we have appealed to the Muslims especially, and so far. We have received a good response, and Ramadan food drive. Usually, most mosques conduct food drives now in their local area and give food to the, the uh, food banks. But let me give you some figures. I'm glad that the um, city of Toronto last week adopted the poverty reduction strategy, and I was there at the executive committee meeting to support the faith in the city and many organizations that uh, some of them I'm part of, like Alliance for Poverty Free Toronto. The uh, uh, Interface Social Reform Coalition uh, Assistance, ISAC, then there's the other, um, other uh, multi-faith alliance to end homelessness part of. Even the labor unions came to tell the city about the poverty in the city. And here are some figures. Toronto is right now the child poverty capital in Canada, a city that is so, supposed to be so rich. New stats, Canada Family and Data released on July 23 shows striking disparity in neighborhood low-income rates. Percentage of children living in low-income families measured by after-tax low-income measure were dramatically from 5% in Leaside, Bennington, Lawrence Park, Kingsway to 50% or over in Regent Park, Moss Park, Thonkler Park, and Oak Ridge. These are neighborhoods identified compared to the rich neighborhood and the poor neighborhood. High poverty rates in many Toronto's 140 neighborhoods. Child poverty in Toronto is the highest in the Greater Toronto and Hamilton area and tied with St. John for the highest among 13 major Canadian cities. Poverty, Toronto poverty rates are the highest in the GTA and among the highest in Canada, as I said. Poverty rates are on the increase once again. Child poverty rates increased between 2010 and 2011 and again in 2012. Child poverty rates in Toronto, 1997 to 2012. 29% of Toronto's half a million children, ages 0 to 17, live in poverty. The percentage of Toronto children living in low incomes increased from 28% to 32% between 1997 and 2004, then declined slowly until 2010, before rising in 2011. About 10,200 more children were living in low-income families in 2012 compared to 2010. Families are not just there on welfare, people may think, when we talk about food bank clients. No, people who have lost, lost jobs. Our food bank in a, is in a condominium building basement where we pay $2,500 rent, biggest expense for the food bank. And we welcome any donations to, for that, to, to help pay uh, the rent to keep that food bank going. We can't even employ full-time staff over there. Volunteers working there uh, most of the time. And the uh, uh, condo owners, some of them, they have be become clients in the last few years because they lost their jobs or other fa family crises that they have suffered. So there are people of all walks of life who can, but some of them are so embarrassed to go to food bank. 
and they really go without food. And here in Toronto, if you go to the shelters, they're always full in the last. I worked in downtown most of my life, especially for, from 1980 to 2005 until my early retirement. And I was seeing more and more people eating from garbage cans or sleeping on the street. And that's what prompted me to set up Ansar Foundation. That's how we can, we as Muslims or as people of faith, we cannot sit idle and see people freeze in the street or eating garbage. We must do something. And thanks, we have one consultant here who is just helping us to reshape the organization. <laughs> the sister vision appeared. It is the sister Radia Khadr, her husband. We just finished our strategic uh, uh, planning uh, for the coming years. And so there are, there's hunger. And who are the people that are feeding the hungry? If you go to these shelters in Sherman Street, George Street, Yarwi Street, or other neighborhoods, it is the people of faith. The Jewish program out of the call has been very active for a number of years and needs the support of all of us. Because people are staying away from the shelter because that is not a healthy environment for them. They're sleeping on the street. Some more stats. Poverty in the GTM camp. Uh, Toronto continues as I say, highest child poverty rate. 883,000 visits to food uh, banks in 2014. $193 weekly cost nutritious food for a family of four. 40% of food bank users under 18 in their suburbs. 41% of adult food bank users who go hungry once a week. And there is also a housing crisis. The rent, people can pay rent, they can't buy food. They buy food, they can't buy the clothes or shoes for the children. So there is a crisis in our city, in our midst, as the topic says, the hunger in our midst is growing. When we took over uh, Flemington Food Bank in 2010, we had 1,000 clients. Today we have 4,600 or more. That's a lot. And that number speaks for the growing number in other food banks as well. This is something for us to think, ladies and gentlemen, that how we can support food banks, no doubt, but how we can reduce poverty in the city, how we can share. In the Islamic tradition, the Prophet Muhammad said that that person is not among us whose neighbors go hungry. He encouraged people to cook extra, or even if you don't, have, just add more water so you can dilute, or you can make the food a little more, and share with neighbors. And Ramadan is the time that the spirit of sharing has started. Say, that Muslims usually share here in Toronto also share with neighbors, and especially uh, if at iftar time, what the people always make something good. In the indo pak tradition, the samosa and the pakora is always on the menu. So there are other things that are there that in different traditions have different food, but they always send to the neighbors and say, hey, this we get a blessing also for your fasting. That's why Ramadan is a month that we share with others. And in this spirit, we must look at the hunger in our midst today, how we can share the food with others, how we can share our resources to make this community more, not rich, but at least a stable community that they all can enjoy a healthy life. And that is the commitment that we must make today in this part of fast. Thank you.